Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at an introduction to statistical modeling in Python. So, uh, you know, once again, we're working through the introductory uh, statistics with Python textbook, and we can get the original code from this website. All right, so uh, in this lecture, we're going to be taking a look at stat models and pandas. So we, you know, we've been working with pandas for a while now in this class, so we should be feeling comfortable with it. So pandas is by far the standard for working with structured data in Python. So remember, structured data means that data that we can put in the format of rows and columns. Any, other, any data that we can't put into that format is called unstructured. And when I say rows and columns, an equal number of rows for each column, equal number of columns for each row. It's a table of data. Uh, so in this format, data is much easier to read for the computer or the human, depending on how we format it. And it's uh, very easy to save and to read data in this format because everything is so cleanly organized. Stats models is an advanced package for statistical modeling with Python. Uh, we're only going to touch on the surface in this class. We're not going to get very deep. I'm hoping that uh, what we talk about in this class is a good primer to get you interested and excited and, and start digging into this. There is some good stuff in this package. And if you want to start digging in, uh, look at some more, here's some good information for you. All right, so now let's go ahead and start importing uh, our packages into our workspace. So I'm going to be pressing F9 on my spider. All right, so let's get NumPy, let's get pandas, let's get SciPy, uh, or get uh, stats from SciPy. And let's go ahead and get set models formula API. And let's get sys. All right, so the formula notation is an important aspect in data science. Here, uh, we're gonna, what we're gonna be using for the formula later on in a couple of lines of code is we're gonna be using the tilde notation. We're gonna say that the dependent variable depends on the independent variable, and we're gonna use a tilde to denote that. You'll notice that when we get to that, we're not using an equal sign. Uh, we're saying that it statistically depends on it. And uh, the, there, there's gonna be some assumed aspects of the relationship, statistically speaking. All right, so now, this next part of the code What's going on here? Well, Python has like three different versions right now. There's Python 1, Python 2, Python 3. And this is one of the downfalls of Python. It's one of the major disadvantages of it because you need, you know, if you get real good at one and you go to another workspace, uh, another uh, office, another, you know, another job, you might have to pick up another one. Um, it's not crazy different between you know, the three different versions, but there's enough of a difference that it causes problems. So this part of the code, what it's doing is it's loading the uh, particular package depending on which version of Python you're using. All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at sys version info. All right, so let's go sys dot version underscore, underscore info. Okay, so here we can see that the major is three, minor is seven, micro is six, and the release level is final, serial is zero. All right, so this is telling me that my version of Spider is using Python three, because of the major. And if I want to, I can pull that up. So that's in the zero position, remember Python indexes uh, starts at zero, at the position zero. So I'm using Python 3. So if I want to, I could just use the code to pull it directly, but I'm going to go ahead and run this if statement because it's so pretty, so beautiful as is. All right, now let's go ahead and get matplotlib. All right, so for our first example, what we want to do, we want to just do a simple linear regression model with some randomly generated data. So this isn't real data. We're just gonna use the random number generator to generate some stuff. I'm gonna build a, uh, I'm gonna build a Y variable where I know what, the, what it looks like, what, how, uh, what the relationship between X and Y is, 
and that way I can take a look and see what's going on. Uh, this is a good way to develop like intuition about uh, regression and uh, frankly any type of statistical modeling is to build random, you know, build variable data where you know the, you know the true uh, population values, generate random numbers, build the model and take a look and see how things vary. And this can give you insight into how, to, how the real uh, situation will look like when you start running with real data. All right, so here I'm just gonna get 100 different values for my X. And then what we're going to do is I'm gonna take the X values, I'm going to multiply by a half, I'm gonna subtract 20, and then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna uh, generate some random noise. And this will be the uh, random error term. And then I'm gonna put the X and Y together to create a data frame. So let's take a look. What does this look like? Okay, so you can see that when I use the A range function on X, it gave me the first 100 values starting at zero. So it goes from zero to 99. And it's in the format of an array. Right now, what do we get when we look, take a look at Y? Okay, so we can see, just kind of looking at this, that as I glance through, it looks like roughly speaking, I'm getting bigger value or greater values as I go from the beginning to the end. So here we start out around negative two, and in the end, we end with you know, a little bit less than 30. So, you know, around 30. And it's, and I can see that's not perfectly growing as I go from the first entry to the last. And that is because of this. So, if I was to redo this, actually, I want, I want to show you what happens if we do it this way. If I take this, all right, so here, this is what the like true value should be if there's no randomness in our data at all, this is what the equation will be. What's going on is the random number generator is, you know, is simulating like the variables that we can't account for in real life. And so this is how, you know, th there are aspects of our data that uh, we do not have, we do not see all important variables. So there's always a bunch of wiggle, there's a bunch of bouncing around. So things never perfectly fit the statistical model. They perfectly fit the statistical model, you're probably doing something wrong. All right, so here is like the true underlying aspect before there is the unaccounted for variables uh, included. And you can see that it goes very nicely, increases by half for each step until so going from negative 20 all the way to just short of 30. Now, if I take a look at the data frame, when I put them together, I can see that it goes through the pattern that we've already talked about. All right, so now, all right, this is paired data. The best way to look at this is, since I have a numeric variable paired with a numeric variable, the best way to do this is to take a look at it as a scatter plot. All right, so take a look at the scatter plot. That looks like a line. Now, it's not a perfect line. You notice that it's not perfectly aligned, well, it looks pretty close. You will never, ever, ever see this good of data in real life. Just letting you know, just get used to it, that you will never have anything this beautiful, this sweet with your real data. If it looks, if it looks this good, you, then something was probably falsified along the way. All right, now let's go ahead and let's fit a linear regression model to this data. So here I can see that I've got you know pretty close to a straight line. I can see that the y-intercept is around negative 20, and I can see that the slope is around one half. And I know that's correct because I generated it, and I can also look at the scatter plot and verify it. Now it's not going to be exactly one half for the slope. It's not going to be exactly negative 20 for the y-intercept, but it's going to be close to it. So let's do this. All right, so notice what's going on. In my modeling it, here, in this tilde, I have y depends on x. That's what the tilde is saying. So we're saying that there's a, this notation, this formula notation is saying that 
Y statistically depends on X. Now, there are other variables that are not fully accounted for uh, it, when I use this tilde notation. That's why I don't have an equal sign. If I had an equal sign, I would, you know, I would be saying that Y is exactly this particular value. No, I'm saying that there is a statistical relationship and we have to figure out what it is. All right, and if we look at model, it's not gonna be very interesting, but let's go ahead and put it down there. So we can see that we've generated a regression linear model. And let's go ahead and take a look at the summary of the model. I'm gonna reprint this. All right, here we go. Okay, so we can see that the dependent variable is named Y. This is an ordinary least squares model. Least squares means that the if I take the observed Y value minus the modeled value, square the all of the square the subtraction, and then add that up for all of the individual observations. That is the smallest value I could possibly get from squaring the di the difference and then adding. And that's calculated using least squares. So you know it's the smallest le smallest value of the sum of squares. Date that was created, the time, number of observations is 100. All right, the degrees of freedom is 98. Why is it 98? So far, we've been talking about uh, you know models that had like minus one degrees of freedom. Well, here it's minus two for the degrees of freedom, and minus two. Why is it two? Well, I've got two parameters. I've got the slope, and I've got the y-intercept. That's two of them. So for each parameter that I'm modeling, that I subtract off one from the sample size. Degrees of freedom of the model is one, and the covariance type is non-robust. So this is like the standard way to do it. Now my R squared is 0.994. You will never see anything that good in real life. You see, see something that good in real life, there is something screwy going on. The adjusted R squared is 0.994. All right, something that you always want to check. If you see these two values deviate from each other, that's a sign that you have an overfitted model. All right. uh, if I have a whole bunch of predictor variables and I put them into a regression model, the more predictor variables I have, the more of a risk I run of overfitting my data. Okay, just like the name implies, if I say overfitting, that's gonna be a bad thing. Underfitting, once again, is a bad thing. Overfitting is worse than underfitting. Keep that in mind, overfitting is worse than underfitting. So something that we always wanna watch out for is overfitting our model. That means I have predictors that are effectively adding a predictor in my model is actually detracting from the results that I get. I'm actually better off with removing some stuff is the idea of overfitting. Okay, so in this situation, we have one predictor variable that's just X. Now, as we go along, we're gonna start throwing in more and more predictor variables, and we need to watch out for the idea of this overfitting. The first way that we wanna check this, it's real easy, if I see that these two values, the R squared and the adjusted R squared start like deviating from each other, they start, there's a difference, uh, then I need to watch out. And R squared will be bigger than adjusted R squared. So uh, now if it's like 0.01, that's, I mean, that, that's practically the same. But if I see something like 0.95 and I see 0.9, that's enough of a difference I'm gonna start getting worried. Now, when is too much of a difference, like problematic? When do I need to worry about it? Uh, that's honestly gray. And you kind of have to just have experience with modeling to know how far of a deviation is important. Now, the F statistic. The F statistic is measuring, do I have a statistically significant model? Now, when I say statistically significant, that means do I have some, are some of my variables in the model informative for my dependent variable? Now, the F statistic, this is asking, do I have one or more useful predictor variables? Do I have one or more? Now, it might be I have only one. I might have, if I have, let's say I have 200 predictor variables in my model, a crazy number, and the F statistic is big. That tells me that I have at least one good predictor variable in there. It doesn't tell me that all of them are good. It doesn't tell me if any of them are bad. It just tells me at least one is good. 
Now remember, the F statistic always is based off and now is looking at a variance measurement. This is looking at the ratio of variances uh, measured within the regression model. It's, it's literally the same thing as ANOVA that we talked about previously. Now, the bigger the F statistic, the more, the more confident I am that I have at least one good predictor variable in there. If I, if I can assume that I have the normal distribution on my residuals and that I have constant, uh, constant variance, constant standard deviation on my residuals throughout for each X value, then I can use the, uh, I, I can use the F distribution to get a P value. Here is the log likelihood of the estimate. Here is Akaiki's information criterion. And here's the Bayesian information criterion. And for right now, we're not gonna really talk about those. Uh, these, are, these are related to each other. They're very similar. What they do, they take into account how complicated a model is and they take a look at how well the, the, data, the data fits the model or the model fits the data uh, for, to measure a combination of complexity and fit together and put them together. Small is good for this one. For AIC and BIC, we really want to use these when we have multiple models to take a look at, excuse me, and to basically I have multiple models and I need to pick one. I use AIC and BIC to pick one among multiple models. It's how we use that. All right, so here is what we get some output on. Here is our intercept. So it needs to, uh, it's gonna estimate what the coefficient is for my linear regression model. So here, our y-intercept is negative 19.8 and our, uh, the slope is 0.497. Okay, so remember that when I generate the data, so this is fake data, I know exactly what's going on because I'm using a random number generator. I know the slope, the real slope of the system is one half. That's pretty close to a half. That's reassuring. And I know that the real, y-intercept is negative 20. That's pretty close to negative 20. I told you that these wouldn't be exactly negative 20 and a half, but they're close. That's good. Now here's the standard, de standard error for each of these. So remember, standard error is the standard deviation of a statistic that we're interested in. Now here, the, here is the t distribution or the t-score. If I want to do hypothesis testing on the uh, hypothesis test that the intercept does not equal zero, and the, uh, or for the slope does not equal zero. And, you know, these are pretty far out there. Remember that like negative three or plus or minus three are pretty far out there values. So, you know, close to zero means it's is gonna be not statistically significant, and away from zero is statistically significant. Three is like starting to move a little far out. So here, the p-value is so small that the, the, the machine just rounds it off to zero. It's, it's practically zero. The machine isn't even gonna bother trying to compute it exactly for us. All right, now here, we get confidence interval. So remember, confidence intervals are my way of evaluating how precise of an estimate do I have. So here's my estimate. I want to get an idea, is this a very precise estimate? Uh, have I got like really well nailed down? Can I be very confident that this is close to the true actual value? Now, in this situation, I know that the true value is negative 20. But in real life, when I look at these values, I don't know it, what the true value is. That's why I'm doing statistics. And if you're doing statistics, you don't know what's going on. That's why you're using data. So. I need to know, do I have a lot of, like, is this, how confident am I that this is close to the correct value? Well, if my standard error is small, I have more confidence that it's close to the true value. And I, ne and I never take it to be the absolute correct value, I take it as my best estimate of the true correct value. So here is the confidence interval, 
if I see that these two values are close to each other, then I have high precision. If they're far apart from each other, I have low precision. And I look at these, I've got, you know, negative 20 point something, negative 19 point something. These are pretty close. This is pretty good. So I'm 95% confident that the true correct value of the coefficient is inside this interval. Now for the slope, I can see that it goes from 0.498 to 0.504. I'm 95% confident that the true correct slope is inside this interval. And I know that it is because of how the data was generated. In real life, I, use, I don't know if what the true value is. And this kind of gives me an idea of what are realistic values for it. If these values are far apart from each other, I don't have a lot of confidence in my estimate. All right, so now here are some statistics to look at. So first of all, look at is skewness. All right, so something that we want to have when we do this is we really want it so that our residuals have constant variance and are normally distributed. So the deviation from, of the Y values from our model, we want to have that deviation have constant variance with respect to the X value, and we want to have that be normally distributed. Okay, so normal distribution has zero skew. That's pretty close to zero. All right, that's good. Kurtosis, so here the kurtosis, um, it's not really where I want it to be. So there's different definitions of kurtosis, and for this one, normal distribution is gonna be, I'll have to look this up, but it's usually around three, either zero or three, depending on how the machine is uh, defining that. You have to use the help documentation, look up which one it is. Now here's the Durbin-Watson statistic, which we'll get to uh, in a, after a few more lectures. The Jacques Berra uh, normality statistic. And here's the probability. So here, I'm going to fail to reject the null hypothesis on this. So here, this is the Jacques Berra uh, normally distributed test. So here, this is asking, we're running a hypothesis test, are the residuals, that is, what is the deviation between observed Y and modeled Y, is, it, is the deviance between them, the subtraction of the two values, if, is the difference between those two values, is that normally distributed, yes or no? Null hypothesis is yes, it is normally distributed, the alternative is no, it's not normally distributed. Here, I see a p-value greater than 0.05, so I conclude that is my residuals are normally distributed. Here's the condition number. And standard errors assumes that the covariance matrix of its errors is correctly specified. All right, so here, uh, it's just, that is something that's important about uh, collinearity and normally distributed. We'll get to that when we start talking about um, multiple linear regression. All right, so that's a quick look at some linear regression. That's some exciting stuff. I hope, I hope you're excited. I hope you're pumped up for this. So let's do another one. Let's go ahead and let's take an example from medical research and let's pull in some data. So once again, uh, what we're gonna do, we're going to use the plus sign to concatenate two character strings. So we're gonna take the website that the data is stored at, we're going to specify which file we want, and we're going to uh, attack them, we're gonna concatenate them together using the plus symbol. So if we check this out, in file, all right, and then we have URL underscore base, because it's all about that base, about that base. All right, so here, I can see that I've got this long website put on there, and what's gonna happen when, I, when we use this plus symbol right here, it's gonna take this character string, and it's gonna paste it at the end of this character string. And let's just do that URL. And so this is an easy way to uh, pull multiple files from one site. That's the advantage of this. All right, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna take 
the website. We're going to pass it to URL open and we're going to pass the, uh, we're going to pass what we pull into generate from text. So it's going to take a text file. It's going to generate a data set for us using the delimiter of a comma. So it's comma delimited file. And let's take a look at what our data looks like. All right, so here we can see that we have a bunch of values and then we have zeros and ones. All right, what's going on here is that these are observed values from patients and the zeros and ones indicate some feature of the patient. Well, it works out that if they're one, the patient is considered lean. If it's zero, the patient is considered obese. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not a very natural way to be looking at, but this is a good data format to be working with. But for our next step, we're, we're going to take a look at box plots. And this format in Python doesn't really work well for box plots. This format is better within R, by the way. All right, so then let's go ahead and do this. Let's hit lean and obese. All right, so here's the lean vector. And we can see, you know, different values. Let's take a look at the obese vector. All right, so we can see that we've got eight obese, val obese values and, or sorry, we have eight measurements from the obese patients and we have 12 measurements from the lean patients. All right, so now let's go ahead and put these together in a data frame. And I'm gonna say lean, uh, is the lean column and obese is the obese column. Let's take a look. All right, just to let you know, this is honestly not a good format to be storing data. This, this format, we're just using it because this is how Python likes to process data for box plots. Uh, honestly, I would have kept it in the original data format if I was uh, you know, working on a project the way I wanted to, but I wanted to get us into this as quick as possible. And this is within uh, Python. This is Python likes to have uh, different data for different box plots in different columns. Um, that's just how uh, you know Matplotlib likes to run. Okay, so the reason why I don't like this format is because this format implies that these are two paired values. They're not paired. These are two different subjects. These are two different subjects but in this format, they appear to be paired. And so that can lead us to confusion and mistakes. So in general, I would not do this, but uh, for the purpose of generating the box plots in a moment, this is a good format. All right, so here we can see that we have about eight for the average of lean and, point, and 10 point, yeah, about 10 for obese. All right, so now let's go ahead and generate the box plots. Okay, so when I take a look at box plots, what I really want to do, I want to look at the boxes. Box plots, look at the boxes. If the boxes vertically do not line up, so if I have something like this, and they go, like I see the box, I see a box, and the boxes don't line up with each other, I am prone to saying that there is a statistical difference between the central tendencies. If they do this, if the boxes are like this, then I am prone to concluding that we have equal central tendency in the data. Now, if I have a huge amount of data, I will always conclude that there's a difference because of the level of precision I have, but uh, it may not be operationally, it may be statistically significant, that doesn't mean it's operationally significant. So here I can see that there's a difference between these two boxes. I look here, you know, the lower quartile for the box is above nine. Here, the upper quartile for the box is just a hair above eight. So I can see that there's a difference. So here, uh, if I run a hypothesis test, I'm probably going to conclude that lean has a lower mean than the obese population. All right, so let's go ahead and actually do the t-test. All right, so now why is it that we're using the t-distribution and not the normal distribution? All right, we use a t-distribution when I want to check to see if two populations have different central tendencies, different averages. 
and I use the normal distribution if I know what the variances of the populations are, if I know what the standard deviations are. Then I use normal distribution. In real life, we don't know what the, what the standard deviation is. So what we do instead, we use the T distribution. All right, so here I have a negative uh, 3.9 for my T-score. Okay, that's, so around negative three, I'm starting to get like extreme values, plus or minus three. If it's in magnitude greater than plus or minus three, then I'm gonna be, you know, I'm leaning towards saying it's not statistically significant, or there's a statistically significant difference. What's my p-value? All right, my p-value is, is 0 0.0008. I mean, that's pretty small. So I'm going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. I conclude that there is a statistical difference between the two populations in central tendency. All right, so here we conclude that there is a significant difference between the two populations because the p-value is below the threshold. All right, that's all I've got for you. I uh, hope you're having fun and enjoying the class. Take care and goodbye.